Oxygen is a powerful general purpose programming language and development environment from RemObject software designed to let developers create all imaginable kinds of projects on a wide variety of platforms from Windows, Linux, Mac, and the web to Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. The Oxygen language provides a combination of language features that ease the development process. From basic object-oriented language concepts found in most modern languages, like classes with methods, properties, and events, to sophisticated specialized language features that enable and ease specific development tasks such as multi-threaded applications and aspect-oriented programming. Many of these features unique to Oxygen. All the features are based on the foundation of Object Pascal and stay true to the language design paradigms that make Pascal great, readable, and discoverable. Let's take a closer look at a couple of these features in action. So a tuple is a new data structure. It's kind of like a cross between an array and a record. It's like an array in that it's a sequence of values, but it's like a record in that all of those values do not need to be of the same type. Most common use case is to have a method that is returning multiple different types, multiple values. So in this case, I have a record that is returning a string, an integer, and a boolean. So three different values of three different types. A tuple can be of any number of types of any different combination of values. You could have a tuple of, uh, in this case, primitive types, or you could have a tuple that contained uh, objects of different types as well. So very flexible in the way it works. And you'll notice it's baked right into the language. The Oxygen language supports tuples as part of the language. It's not some sort of external data structure that you have to construct these objects to use. So this is a common use case here is as a return type from a uh, method. Without a tuple, you would have had to construct an object that contained these types or a record that contains these types or some sort of other complex data structure or have out parameters on your method, both of which are not ideal solutions. Tuples are ideal for this situation when you want to return multiple types. One place where tuples are really common at is in functional programming. And functional programming is all about um, working with sets of data. One thing about tuples is they are immutable, which makes them well suited to functional programming. And that means that you can't change a individual value in a tuple. So a tuple that contains a string integer and a boolean, you cannot change just the integer. You'd have to recreate an entirely new tuple that contained the new value for that integer in it. So let's take a look at using a tuple here. This is the syntax here, I've declared my tuple, that is my return type. And then down here, I am doing some operation on this string. So ideally, when you have a method that's going to do some sort of expensive operation, whether it be time intensive or resource intensive, and you don't want to do that method more than one time in order to get the different values out, that's why you'd want to use a tuple. Recently, I was doing some cryptography, and I was initial creating a uh, initialization value as well as a key in the same method because that was the way the call to the API works. But I didn't want to, I wanted to return both those values out. How do you do that? You have to use a tuple. Otherwise you have to use out parameters. Like I said, not ideal. So a tuple is great for that. Here, doing the operations and then down at the bottom, I'm returning all three values as a tuple. So this is the syntax to assign a tuple. So in this case it's being assigned to return the result of this uh, method by passing it to the out exit. I could have instead, assigned it to a local variable, and then pass that in exit as well. So here is a couple different ways you can use it. So I'm gonna look at this first example here first. I am using the var keyword in order to infer the type. And so I don't have to say, declare what kind of type this tuple is. It automatically infers that from the return type of this method. That's a great feature of oxygen there. So then I'm using the access the num numbered accessors here to access the individual values here. So I'm accessing the string, the integer, and the boolean. Now, the oxygen compiler knows what type each of these are. And so if this wasn't, a if this was an integer, for example, I would get a type mismatch because you can't put a string into an integer. So the compiler knows the individual types that make up the tuple. So then I'm using the values here and then here, this is to show you that it is immutable. If I was to uncomment this line, it would say variable expected because you cannot 
put a value into part of a tuple. The tuple is immutable. You cannot change part of the tuple. So here's another test showing you the different syntax. So here I am taking it and I'm actually assigning this, because remember this is a syntax for a tuple here. And so I'm assign, assigning the result of this into the individual variables, local variables here. And these local variables together make a tuple that matches the signature of this method. So two different ways of receiving the results back of a tuple there. Very useful in functional programming or in when your function is going to return multiple values from it. With the number of cores and multi-threading capabilities in machines today, it's really important to build your application able to take advantage of those. Let me show you a couple examples of how Oxygen makes that very simple. This is a really simple block of code here. All it's going to do is run a for loop and then it's going to call this long operation. Now in this case, this long operation just sleeps the thread, but you can imagine that it's something else that takes a while. And then we're just going to write out the number of the iteration and then the total time it takes to run. So let's go ahead and run that. And you can see the numbers are all coming out here and it took 4,085 milliseconds. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and add in the parallel keyboard. Now the parallel keyboard makes this into a parallel for loop. And I'll run this and you can see what happens. First of all, way faster, only 900 milliseconds. But second of all, you're going to notice that these are all out of order. So what happened is the compiler behind the scenes created a thread pool based on my system architecture. So because based on the number of cores I have, the threading model, my CPU supports, etc., it creates a thread pool that is appropriate for that architecture. And then it runs each iteration of that loop through that thread pool, which allows it to run a number of those simultaneously. The result is it's much faster, but also the order changes. So you need to be aware of that if you're going to use a parallel for loop. You can't have a situation in which the order of the for loop matters, because if you do, it may no longer be in that order. And also, if you're performing operations on a variable, you may need to interlock that as well. So anyway, it makes it very easy to do a parallel for loop with Oxygen. So let's take a look at futures. So this is another very simple block of code, but it will demonstrate our purposes here. So we have an integer here that gets the result of slow calculation and another integer that gets the result of calculation. Now slow calculation is going to write out when it starts and when it finishes, and it's going to do something, in this case again sleep the thread, but imagine it was something that took a while, and then returns the result. The calculation just writes when it goes and returns the result because it doesn't take very much time at all. Now if we run this now, we see there was slow start and there was slow end and then there was a calculation. And that makes sense because here we're getting the value of slow start and here we're getting the value of calculation and it spits them out on that order. Now we can use what's called a future on this. And what a future does is it says, I may or may not need this integer in the future. So don't actually run this calculation until I need it. So if you have something that you're setting something up at the start of a program, but you don't know if you're going to need it or not, that's a good example of when you would use this. So we'll run this now. And see now, calculation occurred first, this line, before slow start and slow end. But also, here it says getting results. And so it did some other stuff in here that took some time. But then as soon as it got down to this line here where it's actually performing the calculation where it needs the value of x, then it goes ahead and calls slow calculation and gets that value for us. So a future says, I may or may not need this in the future, only calculate it when I do in fact need it. Now another feature that we have here is asynchronous futures. So by adding the asynchronous keyword here, that says, I may or may not need this in the future, but if there's ever a time the program's not busy doing something else, go ahead and calculate it just in case. Okay? So I'll run this. 
The calculation, of course, takes place first, but then slow start actually occurs before getting the result occurs because during this period here, nothing else is going on. And so it goes ahead and performs that slow calculation just in case we end up needing it. And in this case we did, and there is the result. So these are some very simple features of the oxygen language that you can add to your program in order to create a more responsive and a faster application, taking advantage of the multiple cores available on modern computers. The oxygen development environment is based on the Visual Studio 2012 shell. This means you can either integrate it into your existing Visual Studio 2012 Pro or Greater IDE or it comes prepackaged with the Visual Studio 2012 shell, so it's ready to go. But it doesn't stop there. It adds a number of enhancements and features, including a variety of templates, inline error messages, the ability to fix errors automatically, or treat fixable errors as warnings. Let's take a look at some of these features in action. The fix it functionality was introduced in an earlier version of Oxygen, and that was where the compiler could detect certain classes of syntax errors, warnings, or other errors in your code that it knew how to fix, and it would give you a single click option to fix those errors. We've taken fix it to the next level though in the latest version of Oxygen. Let me show you. So I have some code here. I'm gonna go ahead and hit build. And it's giving me warnings on all these lines here saying case for identifier does not match original case. So this is telling me there's the case is wrong. Now, just like Pascal, Oxygen's not case sensitive language, but we're all professional developers. We wanna be consistent in our code. We want our code to reflect our professionalism. And so we want it to use consistent casing. So we could use the existing fix it functionality and just click one of these and say, adjust the case for to match string and fix that one line and then fix the next line and then fix the next line. Or if you're paying attention here, you notice there's a new option here. Enable auto fix for W0. W0 is warning zero. That's the compiler code for this particular warning. So if I enable this, then it's going to automatically fix that next time I hit build. So watch here, all these identifiers are gonna magically become uppercase. Now it still gave me the warnings down below telling me it fixed them. So I know what's going on. Nothing's happening behind my back, but now it's fixing those for me automatically. And if I come in here and add a new one, bar 01 object and hit build, it fixed it for me automatically. So now going forward in the future, all my case will be cases will be correct on my identifiers. So my code will reflect my professionalism. Now we didn't stop there. I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna add a new line, console dot. Now you notice I'm missing the E on console, but that's okay because the compiler figures out, has a spell checker in there, it figures I'm probably meant console. So it's gonna come up here and give me the option to have code completion here. So I'm gonna add read key, but watch what happened when I hit build. So that was the old existing fix it functionality is that it gave me code completion here and if I hit on hit click this, it gives me the option to replace console with the console with the E on the end. Okay, so that's nothing new there. But what's new, and I'll show you here, is under options, if I come here to projects and solutions, oxygen, fix it, this checkbox here, treat fixable errors as warnings. If I check that and then come in here and hit OK, I'm gonna hit build, so I haven't changed my code, I'm still missing the E, and I'm gonna hit run. And it's gone ahead and ran my code. And you notice here, it says unknown identifier on console still. So it's still reporting it as a, a warning. So now I can run my code. I can be in the groove, writing code. Doesn't matter if I make a simple spelling mistake. When I hit run, if it knows how to fix it, which there's a lot of errors it knows how to fix now, it will let you run that. And then later, while this is running and I haven't gone out of the groove, I can come back and click that and say replace console with an E. And now my code is syntactically correct and will still run. So this is a great way for you to stay in the groove once you get in the groove writing code and not have to jump back out and fix simple little errors all the time. So another great performance improvement to Oxygen through the fix it functionality. Oxygen is made up of three distinct different flavors. 
The first flavor we refer to as Echoes, and Echoes gives you access to .NET and Mono. The second flavor is Cooper. Cooper was introduced about a year ago, and it gives you access to Java and Android application development. In the third flavor, which is currently in beta, we refer to as Nougat. And Nougat gives you access to Cocoa and Cocoa Touch development, these being the frameworks used for native Mac OS X and iOS development. Let's take a closer look at what each of these individual flavors gives you access to. Echoes lets you use the Oxygen language to develop against the .NET and Mono frameworks. These applications run on the .NET, Mono, or WinRT runtimes, and then give you access to a wide variety of platforms, most notably being Windows, including the new Windows 8 WinRT, as well as ASP.NET and Windows Phone. Cooper lets you use that same Oxygen language to develop against the Java and Android frameworks. And then those applications can run against the Java and Dalvik runtimes, Dalvik being the runtime used for Android, which adds even more platforms into the Oxygen family. And then finally, Nougat lets you use that same Oxygen language to develop against the Cocoa and Cocoa Touch frameworks, and then your applications run against the Objective-C runtime on Mac OS X or iOS. All three flavors of Oxygen use the same Oxygen language. That means the code can be shared between these different platforms against these different frameworks. And now for a quick look at a few of the things you can do with each of the different flavors of Oxygen. Here's a quick look at what you can do with Oxygen for .NET. Under File, New Project, we get a list of all the templates that are available here. Data Abstract, Hydra, and Realm Objects SDK are separate products, but if you have those products installed, then you can see they're all integrated here so that you can take advantage of the Oxygen language for use with these products. What is not available here is if you have the Windows Phone SDK installed, then you'll have templates available for that. Currently, we support uh, Windows Phone 7, 7.5, and Windows Phone 8 will be available and added shortly. If you want to create a Silverlight application, which is a rich internet application, you can use these templates here. The Silverlight class library is a, a assembly that's reusable between one or more Silverlight applications. This is where you would come to create ASP.NET web applications powered by Oxygen. So you're able to use your favorite language to create powerful web applications with HTML, JavaScript, etc. These are your traditional Windows desktop applications as well as, as well as Windows services. You have your choice between WinForms, which uses the uh, legacy Win32 widgets that you're probably familiar with that have been available forever on Windows, as well as the new high-performance uh, WPF uh, user interface controls. WPF controls are much more powerful because they do have hardware acceleration. These are the replacement for WinForms. They've been available built into the operating system since Vista. So this is the new replacement for Win32 and WinForms and the recommended paradigm you should be using if you're doing Windows application development today. You can also build console applications and class libraries here. Um, and then these are just minimalistic project types. Let me give you a demo here of creating a WinRT grid application. Now WinRT is the new Windows 8 runtime that has been created to create applications that can run on Windows 8 desktop, ARM-based tablets, and Intel-based tablets. And also, when Windows 8, S Windows 8 Phone SDK gets supported, you should be able to create cross-platform applications that can be supported on all four platforms, desktops, both tablets as well as the phone. Very powerful here. This is also the applications that you can create that will be available to be installed and purchased through the Windows Store. So definitely something you want to take a look at if you're interested in supporting Windows 8. The grid application, which is what I'll show you here, is for creating an application that has a grid of tiles available to the user. A split application has a master in detail available on the same, book, same, same page. And then WinRT application is a very minimal application for WinRT 
security if you're wanting to create an application without having any of the stuff set up for you in advance. And of course, a reusable class library. Let's go ahead and create our grid application here. So there's a lot of code that gets put into here for us from our template that is very useful. So I want to make sure you're familiar with all of it here. You have your package app manifest, which is what describes your application to the OS as well as to the store. There are things here to control the orientation you support. Here's the logos your application uses, which are stored in your assets folder here. So here's your logo. You can replace that logo as well as some other graphics that are used in the application. Um, short names, uh, display names, descriptions of your application, as well as capabilities and declarations. To capabilities are things that you're declaring your application is going to do so that the store will have to approve those when they get it from the store. Or declarations are things that you tell the app, the OS, that your application is able to do to interact with the OS. Things like search. Very powerful here. The app XAML pass file is the main entry point for your application here. So right here we have an on launch event, which is where your application is launched. It um, handles automatically the sus uh, suspension manager to restore the previous state. Now the suspension manager is in this common folder here, along with some other uh, source code that gives you some very advanced functionality in your application already. Also here in the app manifest is the on suspending, which is when your app's being removed from memory, closing down, it automatically saves a state with the suspension manager. Also in the common folder here is this standard styles. These are styles that are used in your app in order to give your app that consistent look and feel that all WinRT applications have. We have a data model here, and this is what provides the data that is used by these three pages, the group detail page, the grouped items page, and the item details page. So the grouped items page is the main page of our application. We have, uh, we can select items in here and edit them right on the design surface or via the properties window here as well as via the XAML view. So down in here, you can just edit the XAML directly. XAML is an XML-based language for defining user interfaces. Edit that XAML, and it's reflected automatically in all three places. We're going to replace our data source here to get a little more interesting data source. So I'm just going to delete that one and add a new one in here. Actually, instead of a new one, I'm going to use an existing one. But these are some of the different things that we could add in here. So we could add another group detail page, a user controls, and stuff like that into our application. Let's go ahead and add existing item. There's our new data source. So each of these XAML files also has a Pascal file behind the scenes. Now the Pascal file is the uh, object code, the interactivity for that page. So this page here has a header click, an item click, and a load state. So load state is just when the uh, page is first displayed in WPF and as well as in WinRT, the screens are called pages. And it's kind of a, maybe a different paradigm than you're used to, but once you get past the terminology, it's pretty straightforward. Here's the header click, and it's going to navigate to the group detail page when they click on the header, and the item click is going to navigate to the item detail page when that's clicked on. So we're going to go ahead and run this, and it'll deploy it automatically to our local machine, and let us see what the application is going to look like. There is the splash screen, which of course you can change. And we can see now we've loaded up some nice, rich wallpapers here. You can scroll through these. They, uh, you notice have a little animation as they're clicked on. So I can click on individual items to go to that items page, or I can click on the header to go to the category page. And so this has a, a category image as well as individual items image. And then from here I can go to the individual items page, back and back. So all of this stuff was built in for us automatically in the template. So if you do have something that is in a uh, categories that you want to display to your users, this is a great way to get started with that. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the suspension manager here. I've gone into the Cityscapes category page. I'm going to go back to Visual Studio, and I'm going to relaunch it. So this is rebuilding it, removing it from memory, and launching it again, redeploying it. And so you're going to see that the suspension manager 
maintain the state between sessions. All built into your application for you, ready to go. So very cool what you can do here with the WinRT templates. If you want to get a look at some of the other stuff you can do with Oxygen for .NET, if you come in here to the Rim Objects Everwood welcome screen, you see this when you first come into Oxygen for Well after installing it, and you can come in here and say, I want to look at, for example, WinRT examples. Here's three examples of that. Integrating with Search, for example, you can take a look at uh, how you can use Link, Language Integrated Query, very powerful feature there, as well as um, Cirrus, Aspect Oriented Framework, ASP.NET, etc. All these samples are available here. Just come in here and select the sample you'd like to take a look at and double click on it and it loads it up for you in the IDE ready to go. Here's a quick look at what you can do with Oxygen for Java. Come in here, File New Projects, and we see all of our Oxygen for Java templates. The Data Abstract comes from Data Abstract for Java and Room Objects SDK for Java, which you can see are nicely integrated in here if you're wanting to combine those products together. Under General, we can create a, a Java console application, class library, and then you also might use these to build up to create a Swing application. We don't provide templates for Swing specifically, but you could certainly um, build your application using Swing or any other Java widget library uh, based off one of these templates here. We also provide uh, templates for a Java applet for to be deployed on the website, or probably the most common thing you're going to be using it for is creating Android applications. So let's go ahead and do that now. So here we go. This has created our Oxygen for Java template for us here. This project, you'll notice, is got all the same contents that a application would be created if you create it with ADT, which is Android's tool they give you for free. Except you have the advantage of being able to take advantage of Oxygen programming language. So we have our Android manifest in here that describes your application to Android OS. We also have a reference to the Android SDK, which has gone out and found it on my computer for me. If it's not able to find it, it prompts you to, to specify where the SDK is installed at. And then also my layout here. Layouts are defined in XML in Android. We do have IntelliSense in here so that you can add additional attributes or additional uh, views to your application as well. So very easy to work with the XML layouts. And then behind the layout, so we have main layout, we have main activity. An activity is the class that uh, hydrates the layout and then provides interactivity for that layout. So in here, if you notice in our layout, we have a button named my button. And in here we go get my button and we assign an on click listener, a click event handler to that button. And in that click event handler, all we do is increment this count and then display the count on the button. Very simple little application, but gives you an idea of how easy it is to build with Android. So let's go ahead and run this. It will either run it in the simulator if you don't have a device installed, but if you have a device installed, it'll run it there. And I think that's more interesting, so let's go ahead and do that really quick. Because we're working with the Android SDK directly and not including any abstraction layers or anything like that, you can actually use this with any version of Android you want to. All you gotta do is connect the USB cable to your phone and then come in here and hit start. Oxygen is building this for the Dalvik runtime, packaging it up into an APK bundle, deploying it onto my device, and then starting it and connecting the debugger. So you can see there it's deployed it for my phone. Down here we see this is a list of what LogCat is outputting. LogCat is, gives me everything that's happening on my phone, whether it comes from my application or not. I can then filter this down to just from my application if I want to. But right now it's giving me all the information that's coming from my phone. So now that the application's on my phone, I can click the button and you can see the click is incrementing there. But since I'm running it in debug mode, I can actually come in here and set a breakpoint. So put a breakpoint right there inside the button on click. And now when I click it, you see the button is remaining orange because it's stopped in this breakpoint in here. So I can bring in my cursor and inspect count. Shows count is currently equal to five. I could change that value. 
uh, do a further debugging if I wanted to, or I can go ahead and remove that breakpoint and hit continue. And you can see now it displays five clicks. Because Oxygen for Java doesn't to make use of any abstraction layers, you have the entire Android SDK and Dalvik runtime available to you. Everything that's available on the device you can do with Oxygen for Java. Again, you can come in here to the Everwood welcome screen, Oxygen, and go down here to Java and take a look at some Android examples of some of the stuff you can make use of in Oxygen for Java for Android application development. This is a quick look at using the newest flavor of Oxygen, Nougat, to develop for iOS. We're going to go ahead and say New Project. Here's our templates available under Oxygen Nougat. We have Mac templates for building Cocoa applications and console applications, and static libraries. A static library is a library that can be reused between multiple applications, whereas Cocoa is the framework for the UI widgets that are for use in native Mac OS X development. So this is exactly the same widget you'd be using if you were developing in Objective-C on the Mac, but you can use Oxygen instead. And you get the same framework, so you're going to have the same, an app that's going to look the same, behave the same as any other app on the system. Under iOS, we have an option for static library as well, as well as a universal master detail app, but I'm going to start right now with an empty app real quick and just show you how to put this together. So there we go, we've created our template project here. This is going to use Cocoa Touch, which is the native framework for building iOS applications. There's no abstraction layer in here, nothing that's trying to look like or act like Cocoa Touch, it's pure Cocoa Touch. First thing that I do is specify our Crossbox server. Crossbox is the mechanism that allows Oxygen to communicate with a Mac because the deployment and debugging and part of the build process has to be done through a Mac. So if I have a Mac set up on my local network running Crossbox, it will automatically discover it like it did right here. If not, then I can come here and say add server and point it to a Mac on my local network or a Mac maybe on a remote network if the Mac is hosted in a hosting service, for example. If I'm building a Mac application, this is the option I'm gonna select here. But since I'm not building a Mac application, it's grayed out. Instead, I can choose from these options. I can choose to build it for the simulator on the iPhone or iPad. Now the simulator build is actually a different build than you would build for the device. And that's because the simulator is actually running x86 code instead of ARM code. This is what I want to select if I want to build for the device to maybe submit through the app store. And then here, since I have my iPhone actually connected to my Mac, I can build select this and it will build for my iPhone and deploy it on my iPhone and let me debug it on my iPhone. Very cool. So let's go ahead and select that. Since I'm actually deploying to hardware, I have to set up my provisioning. So I'm gonna come here to my project and select properties. Come down here to NuGet. And I just have to select my provisioning profile and my code signing certificate name. That's it. All that information was actually imported from Xcode for me automatically, so I didn't have to remember all that information. It's all done for me. And now I'm going to set up my application. My app delegate is the object that responds to different states of the application. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to set up my table view controller, but I have to add a table view controller first. So I'm going to say add new item iOS table view controller, and I'm going to call it my table view controller. There we go. So now let's go ahead and initialize that in here. And I'm going to just paste some code in here to make things go quicker. Now, first thing you might notice in here is there's a space in these names. So a space in the declaration of this method name here and a space in the call of this method name. And that actually comes from Objective C in the way that it handles parameters. Did you have these spaces in uh, in the way things are called? And it makes code more readable. And because of Pascal's syntax, that is a very readable syntax, this combination of these spaced spaces in names with Pascal's readable syntax makes a really good fit in Oxygen so that we can have this much more readable syntax in Oxygen Nougat. So here it says, 
having a new UI navigation controller with root view controller, and then we're passing in the new root view, the new table, my table view controller. So it makes it more readable. In other code samples, you'll see that this becomes a much more readable scenario. So now that we've initialized our root view controller and attached the table view controller to that, we're gonna go in our table view controller here, and we're going to just set this up really quick. So we need to tell it that we want um, number of rows in a section, we're gonna say 20 rows in a section, 20, and we just have the one section. And in here, we need to put some code in to initialize our cell. So I'm just going to paste some more code in here. And this will initialize our cells and then put the row number for the cell's text value. And that's it, we're ready to rock and roll. Now my iPhone is already connected to my Mac and Crossbox pointing to my MacBook Pro, so I can go ahead and hit start and it will build and deploy it onto my iPhone and start the debugger. So there we go, we can see that it's deployed onto the iPhone and launched it. Now, I didn't remove these warnings here, these are just places that I would want to implement code in the template, that's just there for my information, no harm there. But it's connected and you can see I can scroll through this and this has the really nice gravity effect that table views have in iOS. So it looks like an iOS application, behaves like an iOS application, because it is a native Cocoa Touch iOS application. It's gonna behave exactly the way users expect it to, and it'll look exactly the way users expect it to. So there's a quick introduction to using Oxygen Nougat for iOS development. Putting this all together is sure to make Oxygen your new favorite programming language. Remember, Oxygen includes all three flavors in one package, giving you access to .NET, Java, and Cocoa development. It also includes the Visual Studio 2012 shell, along with all the special integrations and enhancements. You get the command line compiler, as well as a special utility called Oxidizer that makes it easy to convert code from c -sharp, Java, or Delphi into Oxygen code. You can learn more about Oxygen at rimobjects.com slash oxygen.